This is Officer Bell. I'm going on tape. It is the 30th of October, 2012. It's going to be an interview with Israel Keys at the FBI building. Present's going to be SA uh, Special Agent Jolene Godin and TFO Bell with Israel Keys. I'm on tape. It is 9:47. You have the right to remain silent. You understand that? Yep. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You understand that? Yes. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have him present with you while you're being questioned. You understand that? Yes. If you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before and during any questioning if you wish. You understand that? Yes. You can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. You understand that? Yes. Um, I understand also that you have standby counsel, Rich Kirtner, maybe Jackie, uh, Walsh, and Mark. Um, would you like any of them present right now? No. Also, I just want to clarify that when we came over this morning, we didn't interrupt any meetings that you have with attorneys or anything. You said no. you had something going on this afternoon. We'll get you back by lunchtime. Will that accommodate whatever you have planned this yes. afternoon? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. We can't, we're not here to talk about anything with Samantha Cloning. We can't talk about that. You right. understand that? All right. So, like we said, we mentioned we want to just talk with you, update you on last week. What happened? I've talked with Kim um, several times actually over the last few days, and can fill you in on that. And we're going to be returning a bunch of stuff to Kimberly. So, um, before I we jump into that, did you have anything that you questions you had for us? Anything that you wanted to? No. Okay. So, just jumping back to last week, the last time I met with you, we talked to you about how we um, were going back uh, to do a search in the house and then in, on the New York property for un for other crimes. So we're not talking about Samantha Koenig stuff here. And so um, we did that on Tuesday? Was it Tuesday? The 23rd. 23rd, okay. Um, New York happened the same day. Right. Um, Thirst actually took two days. We uh, we were finished up you know, by the end of the, by the, before Kim even finished work, we were finished up. And so um, we took, um, a bunch of some things from the house and that search, um, types of things that we took, um, jewelry, knives, um, headlamp, ropes, a, a bunch of rec like document kind of stuff, travel record kind of stuff that was based on, that was mixed in with um, like tax things, um, paper document kind of things. Um, we talked with Kim, I talked with Kim a bunch of times that day, and then I've continued to talk with her since then. And there are a number of things that she's asked to have returned, and so we're working on getting those back to her. Um, and so, like, things that, documents, the jewelry. I didn't bring the jewelry and i got to grab that. Um, we're going to be sitting down with Kim to look at the jewelry um, so she can tell us what's hers, what's not hers, that kind of thing. We're just waiting for that to be coordinated. She's she's waiting actually to hear back from the attorney that she has to figure out a time that that can happen. So, um, but basically, the my conversations with Kim I think have all been positive. I mean I know her experiences haven't always been positive, um, but I think it's been I think it's, it was different this time. One of her concerns was. You know what condition we were going to leave the house in, and that kind of thing. And the house was left in good condition. We actually condition. swept the floors. Well, and we actually cleaned a little bit. We did. We did um, pretty good. Because yeah. um, we understand that she was. She didn't seem. She didn't have any complaints that she voiced to me about that, um, about the condition, way the house was left, or anything like that. Um, and she's. We've been talking back and forth about trying to, for her, on her side, because it sounds like she's working some pretty long hours, trying to find a time to sit down and talk and. So my last comment to her, or text with her last night was basically whatever works with her schedule. If it has to be at 8 o'clock at night, we'll make it at 8 o'clock at night. It doesn't, you know, we'll certainly do what we can to accommodate her at this point because um, she's not the focus of, I mean, she didn't do anything wrong. You know what I mean? She's not the focus of this kind of stuff, and we certainly want to do what we can do to accommodate her.
We did get the, the fanny pack from that you said that the jewelry from the Alito fire was in. So we do, oh. have, we do have that. And I actually have all the jewelry, and so I'd like to bring it in, and I can we can show it to you as well, and you can point out stuff if you remember what's. Was pretty much everything in the fanny pack. Is the fanny pack also from the house, or was that something that you had also? If you remember. Because there was probably four, five, six pieces of jewelry, maybe. Uh, necklaces. I'll, I'll bring it over. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I'd have to see it. Okay. We'll bring it in and so you can look at it. Um... Looks like she is getting the house working on. Somebody's working on the house further. It looks mm -hmm. like it, the downstairs is pretty much gutted, which made it. I mean, the reason it went so fast. I mean, she had a lot of stuff boxed up. You know, so she was either going to do stuff. Some of this stuff is Laney's. Some of this stuff is yours, and she's got it to, you know, package it up. So. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wasn't. Uh, I'm a little unsure as to why. You did the searches the way you did. I have my theories, but I mean, I made it pretty clear in early interviews what was at Kimberly's house, and I told you where everything was relevant was. We uh, we know that, and we and we pass that along. I mean, we're not mm -hmm. the our bosses that have listened to this, you know, to the interviews and stuff, and they know what you've been telling us. And but they wanted to do it by the book. They That's want what they what, what they want to do is they want to make sure that. Uh, and you can understand this, Israel. Is that nobody wants to look foolish in this. We, want, we have to. We also have to do things that are standard in our procedure and things that happen in, in, in lots of cases. And so, I mean, right? They, they're not willing to take you at your word for everything you say. Well, I understand that, but you have to look at it from my point of view. It was, uh, that was a stipulation in the initial. We, I, we know that. We told them that. And that's we. We pushed as hard as we could, as long as we could, and I mean, yeah. Well, I figured, it, like I say, it was inevitable that. Uh, but you know, that doesn't mean I'm happy about it. I can tell you, I know you're not happy about it. I don't blame you for not being. We're not happy about it. But, uh, All right. Well, I mean, I wish there was a better answer for you, but it it is what it is. I mean, we're we're stuck in the situation we're in with our communications and. Us dealing, balancing everything that we have to balance. Same as things what you're doing. Not, you know, much right. smaller degree. I know. Yeah. All right. Any questions about kind of Kimberly and? She's just been talking to you by phone. Uh, she has she agreed to come in for an interview or? And it's not going to be an it's not going to be an interview. Basic. Um, we've talked by text and then also by phone and in person that day. Um, and basically, what what um, we're going to do. Um, is sit down and go over, go through the jewelry. Same thing I'm going to do. We're going to do with you today too. And then um, there were some other things that she wanted back, so we're going to return the stuff that she wanted back. And then because um, I still haven't talked to her, so I don't really know. I've heard some things through the grapevine from her, but mm -hmm. everything else that I know about the search, I got from the news. You know, so. Very reliable source. Right. <laughs> no, we um, I mean we've we've texted. It's been it's been you know pretty cordial. I haven't talked to Kimberly. I don't. You know, Kimberly had an attorney, so it's not like we have had really had conversations right. where I've been able to just call her and stuff. But that's changed a lot since we. I actually got to meet her last week and talk to her in person and that kind of thing. And so. Um, you know, she's obviously frustrated by the situation, and that's understandable. And so that's why we said we're going to do everything we can to try to um, All right. uh, to try to alleviate. You know, do we can? She's got enough stress. She doesn't need added stress, wondering when she's getting stuff back and all that kind of crap. So we're going to do what we can to work with her on that. Um, I know. Uh, Jodine called me last week too for for Kimberly. The day it was the day of the search that she yeah, called. So um, I don't know. I know you've heard stuff through the news, but you mentioned Grapevine. Is there other stuff that you're hearing that has you concerned? Or well, I was I wasn't going to get too concerned about any of it until I actually talked to Kimberly. But I might not talk to Kimberly for a while because I know that she was pretty shook up by having it on the front page of the paper mm -hmm. again. 
and she doesn't, she's uncomfortable enough coming to the jail to talk to me without yeah. having it at the forefront of everyone's mind again. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. so that's the concern right now. I don't know when, you know, I will talk to her, but I'm just saying I, I haven't heard it from her perspective. Okay. I expect that I'll probably be meeting with her sometime in the next couple of days. Is there anything you want me to tell her? No, I, I okay. mean, I can I can talk to her. I can get messages to her. I, I was more... Um, she knows she can talk to me about this stuff okay. if, if she needs to. So I was waiting to hear from her, but uh, okay. you know, like I say, I don't know when that will be. Okay. Started. Does she know that you're talking to us? Yeah, she knows that I have. Okay. Yeah. The only reason I ask is because when we talk with her, I, I don't intend to tell her anything about our conversations, but I just didn't know if, if she knew if, that, if she was going to ask me about it about things you were saying or anything like that. I didn't, I didn't know. I don't know what she'll ask you okay. about me. Okay. I, just, I didn't know what I, I assume level. that she, at this point, knows that I've talked to you. Okay. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure I told her that straight out a couple times, but I don't know. She certainly doesn't know the extent of everything. I don't go into detail. Yeah, understandable. Were the uh, pugs yours or were those Kimberly's? One of them is mine, the black one. It was yours, and then she did she already have did she have pugs when you guys met her? Yeah, she, she had one, and then she she's been acquiring them. They're, <laughs> they're pretty cute dogs. I like the uh, setup you have too for them to get outside. Yep. They, uh, Stairway to pug heaven. Didn't hear it peep out of them unless they came outside to bark. When we went in there, they must have they must know where the treat jar is or the treat thing is because I reached up at one point and they went crazy like their little <laughs> wine pug howl thing they have going <laughs> so no but they were good they were very good dogs okay so i'm just going to pull this stuff out and we'll just we'll go through it and if you can tell us if there's anything in here that you know i know you've talked about how you don't we're not going to get into other stuff until some decisions are made. Right. Um, but if there's anything in here that we need to set aside, right. if you can just let us know that and we can leave it All right. at that, okay? All right, I'm not going to pull any, everything out, but if any of this stuff looks... Was all of that in that box? When yeah. You took the box? Yep, it was all in the box. Yeah. Anything that's in that box is Kimberly's. Okay. That box I made for shortly after we met, so okay. everything that's always been in there has been either been jewelry finished. that I got for her or that she had okay. prior to it. Jewelry that you bought for her, not mm -hmm. jewelry that we need to be concerned no, about. Jewelry. I never gave her anything that was. Okay. Paid for by myself. Okay. That would be pretty tacky. <laughs> but I'm sure it's been done before. So. <laughs> right. Does this look like the fanny pack? Yeah. And that we're talking about the fanny pack from Texas. Right. Right. So at least well, the, did, did did you get the fanny pack in Texas also, or was no, it your I fanny pack? That That's your. Oh, fanny okay. Pack. okay. My misunderstanding. All right, here's a bunch of the stuff that's in there. These are all tangled. Yeah. This is interesting. like stuff that yeah I thought it was in a separate bag in the fanny pack but if it was just stuffed in there then I must have dumped it out in there I don't know okay 
When we initially found it, it was all right in here. Oh. It was, and then we put it in here just so it wouldn't fall out. So maybe that's what it was. In the front side. Yeah. I don't think jewelry-wise, there's not anything else in Kimberly's house that is related to anything aside from that. Okay. That stuff wasn't even supposed to be in the house. So. You mind if we yeah, go you... through it just to be sure? Because I don't. Kimberly, Kimberly actually handed this to us because she had. Because the downstairs, like Jeff said, it's everything's clear out of the downstairs. She probably come across it. So right. just to make sure, we'll, we'll go through everything else that nothing came out of here that you recognize it's in mixed with other stuff. Right. That's. Pretty remote possibility that she would have taken anything out of that. She re she would recognize that as mine, and she's not the type to remove anything from it, especially in light of what's happened. So. Did she ever ask you about that stuff, like where it came from? I, sh I she I doubt she'd ever seen it till now. Yeah, till she right because it wasn't even supposed to. Was this not in that? Oh, thank you. And I think that's the impression we got too, because when we mentioned it, she went and got it. This she found. She knew she had come across it. To packing your stuff up. Yeah. Thought that one was interesting. That one I bought. You have a couple of them. Yeah, it was part of a Halloween costume. No significance to anything. <laughs> Aside from my general interest. <laughs> Jumping back a little bit, does she have you ever talked with her about the couriers? Kimberly, does she know anything about the couriers from you since my arrest? Yeah. No. Or even prior to your to your no. arrest? No. Certainly, certainly not prior, but I mean, since then, you know, when the story came out on the news, she she brought it up. Okay. And but no, I never told her anything specific. Okay. I've always been very vague. Was she left with the? I'm, I'm thinking about this just because she's probably going to ask me questions, so I want to be careful about what I say also. Was she left with the impression from you that it was just something you didn't want to talk about or that you were involved somehow? or? Well, from her perspective, the only thing she knows is that there's a reporter in Vermont that is saying I'm connected to it. Okay. That's all that there's been in the news, okay. as far as I know. Did you? I'm it's never been concerned, confirmed by. No, no, no. I'm, I'm wondering if you confirmed it. If you had any conversation with no, her, confirmed no. No, the only thing I think I've said openly is that yeah, I've been. You know, they all know I have property in New York, and I've told them several times. Yeah, I've driven through that area several times. I've stayed in hotels okay. there. I've, okay. Aside from that, I don't recognize that at all. <laughs> Sapphire stuff is Kimberly's. I don't know about the pearls. Okay. I know that sapphire stuff is hers. Okay. This looks like it's a set with the earrings and the... Right, and the, the ring and the necklace, yep. yeah. Okay. She had that before. I, heard, so. I think that might be... Well, two of those. Um, I think that's it for jewelry. Okay, so from what you can tell, the only everything's in this bag. From what yeah, that's the only thing. I mean. Okay. Were you a pirate that year? Or 
<laughs> we did think that was a little ironic when we came across that. A couple of them. <laughs> oh, we're going to design. <laughs> we even counted. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> I thought you might. So you got that in like 2010. <laughs> <laughs> Um, trying to think if there was anything else um, from the search that was like significant that we should show you. Um, I can't think of anything. I mean, like I said, there were things that we, um, some of the things that we took that I talked about already with Kimberly and are going. We're giving them right back. For some of the like the travel receipts and that kind of stuff that she needs for taxes, obviously we have no need to screw up her taxes or no desire to do that. So right. um, we copied whatever stuff we needed and then I'll give that back to her. When you say travel, I thought everything I had was in that filing cabinet. You already had the filing yeah. cabinet, right? Yeah, we have the file cabinet from when you told us we could take that a few months right. ago. No, there was some other stuff too. Um, there was a there was some stuff mixed in with her stuff, mixed in oh. with like her tax records and. Um, I think maybe even some of your tax. You might have missed some write-offs. So. <laughs> yeah, I never was too concerned. <laughs> <laughs> so. But regardless, it's going back. It's not anything. All right. Um, I mean, we know she's upset about the thing, but we're trying to make it as you know, she just wants this, the whole thing to be over. I'm sure, but she doesn't understand the, the gravity of it, and so. Right. Um, any other questions about? Uh, no. Oh, we took okay. Yeah, and unfortunately, like Jeff said, we don't have to go through it again. But we were in the position that we were in, pushing back as long as we could push back, and then they didn't. Our bosses did not to view progress this, the know, same way that we're viewing progress. They've been pushing it for, you know, since yeah. we've really made good progress, and then when the time you came in. We talked about Green River, Wyoming a little bit. That was encouraging to them, so that delayed it. And then they just saw a stall again. So every time they were seeing stalling, we and we and we've been trying to be upfront with you and telling the the, you know, the reality. And we we know what you've also told us is that you've told us what was there, and we weren't going to find any more and those kind of things. But right, and we relayed all that. But I don't have a list yet from the agents that were in New York. But I, when I get, as soon as I get that, we'll go over that with you too. I don't. Well, that'll be a walk down memory lane. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound like they picked up on that though. I'm sure that reporter's really bummed out because she didn't even find out FBI about it. FBI was gone already. They were, they were gone. They were there two days, and the reporter didn't hear about it until the day, that, the third day, when they were already gone. So all their, their neighbors called in. I, you know, I don't know. So all their photos were just so. of, of a house. There's no. <laughs> There's no people walking around or anything, and yeah, so sad. They missed their they missed their big day. Yeah. Um, I think that was it. I can't think of anything. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I can't think of what it is right now. Um, so yeah, so we'll get you the list. You can take your walk down memory lane. We'll get that list and probably some photos and stuff from out there. Um, of what they, what they did. Did you rent it, ever? No. Did your family stay there after you, for a short time? Yeah. Okay. Because it sounds like they talked mostly about the the the, na the only thing the neighbors remember. It sounds like a family living there. So I wondered if that was your family, years after you. Right. Yeah, that was the only time I lived in it was with my family. And that was before the military. Right. Okay. Cause they was it livable then? Because my understanding now is pretty. <laughs> no. When was the last time you walked through well, it? I guess the different floors. definitions of livable. Well, back then it was. It had always been lived in, so yeah, it was in a lot better shape. But it's never had electricity. So. No, but it sounds like the floors are weak in places. Well, the roof caved in okay. about four or five years ago. So. When was the last time you were there? Visiting. Well, just last uh, June before like, when I was in. The courier. Okay. So you drove through there, drove by there? Your your family, your brothers aren't by there, though. They're in Maine, right? Right. Okay. Okay. 
Wait, any... You have an artesian well or something on it? Yeah, kind of well. Sounds, sounds like, like the neighbors Sounds like they've water. been helping themselves to water. So right, to get yeah, some water I noticed rights. that last time I was there. <laughs> <laughs> the county spring. <laughs> it must be good water because yeah. it sounded like... That's what one of the neighbors said is they make a truck to get uh, water from your well. Yeah. So. All right, um, the other thing that we um, wanted to do is... A while back, you had mentioned that when we were talking about Washington, that you had just thrown out a comment that at some point you might be interested in meeting the people down there that would eventually be working, whatever's going down there, or talking to them. The we have there's two other agents here from Washington that have been up here helping with us and stuff, and so they're here. So we wanted to introduce you to them. They're the ones who talked to Dave. They went and got the boat. They agents. Sure. FBI. FBI. Agents. They're FBI. the ones who uh, that searched the boat, and so they. Got some information that they would share with you, and you could answer them, ask them any questions about it if you wanted to. But just so you have a face to go with the people that down the road. I might not be dealing with the FBI in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong with the FBI in Washington? <laughs> same place, same thing that's wrong with them everywhere, I would assume. I haven't met them in Washington, so I don't know. <laughs> this is your chance. This is your chance. There's nothing wrong with us. See, now I can play this because I'm kind of not, I'm, I'm kind of part time. Yeah, I'd be honest. He's a wannabe FBI yeah, agent. That's right. FBI so, agent. not really. No. Wannabe FBI Is that any better? <laughs> it's not so much the individuals I'm referring to, it's the, everybody higher up the food chain, you could say. Yeah, well. Every organization, I think, has their issues, unfortunately, but. I hadn't really considered that, but um, wouldn't hurt to listen. To I, the, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's fine. Though. You, uh, we'll take a break real quick and go uh, get them. We have a candy bar. If you want, you want a candy bar? No, I'm good. With that, so. All right, take a break quick and. You don't need to piss or anything during the. No, I'm good. There. It's 10.23 by my lunch. Okay. All right. Go ahead. You know us. Awesome. I'll let these guys uh, introduce themselves to you. Hello. Uh, I'm from the local office. We cover all the way up to the bay. All right. Colleen Sanders. Hello. 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 So we thought that we'd bring them in and they could just, uh, I don't know, did both go out to talk to Dave? Both of you been out to three? Yeah. Right. The, the boat, he's the one who, who uh, towed the boat back. The wheel bearings made it all the way to, yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit of water in it, probably uh, a couple hundred <laughs> gallons. Well, there's Nia Bay. <laughs> the cover shredded uh, by the time we got to Clallam Bay, so we had to pull that in. But, uh, um, yeah, when when I think when you first got picked up in Texas, we got asked to you know, start doing some background, and so we did some of the initial interviews and talked to you. Um, your ex-mother-in-law talked to Tammy once, um, talked to Dave a few times. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions about that or all. Uh, we returned the boat oh, a couple weeks ago, I think, to Dave. With your permission to Dave, you know, you said he could have it back and park it over there. He wanted it back, so. Yeah, yeah, I called him and asked him if he wanted it, and he said he did, so uh, we returned it to him. You'll have to work out the legal transfer. Yeah, you guys have the title, so <laughs> it pretty much belongs to you, right? <laughs> Well, no, it actually belongs, well, whatever. He's got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the only real damage on it was when we tried pulling it out there, the trailer jack was rusted so solid the handle popped off. So that's going to be replaced, but Dave said that wasn't a problem. He could fix that pretty easy. So, did you have any questions for us about any of the stuff we've done out there or anything like that? No. Do you, do you, I know um, sure you do. we're not going to you know, talk about Not anything they're going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> try it. I don't know. Yeah, try it. <laughs> no. Dave, was Dave a co-worker? You worked with him? He was my boss. He was your boss. Okay, I know you guys do that, but I, I get people. And he wasn't your boss initially, right? It was um, uh, Hill. Is it... Uh, Mr. Hill, wasn't he, was he your boss initially? 
Joe. I'm forgetting his first name. Um, yeah, I mean, you switched positions when you had initially gotten out there. You took one job and then you switched over to Parks and Rec, or was it the opposite? No, I was always Parks and Rec. Okay. okay. Dell Hill? Yes, Dell. Go. Doesn't surprise me that he would tell you he was <laughs> boss. I haven't, no, I haven't <laughs> talked to him. <laughs> uh, wasn't your boss? He wasn't, but he's probably going to go around claiming he was. No, point. we haven't talked to him, but I, I know him from another case that we had out there unrelated to this. And I think Dave inferred at least that. Dell supervised you to some degree initially, or something like that. So, yeah. He was, yeah, he was supervisor of the building that I worked out of, but my, our departments, he was wastewater and I was parks and rec. Okay. That was the only place where they probably combined one of those two departments. But that's <laughs> okay. the way it works in the MBA, so. Did you ever meet the other FBI agents out there that? were before the two of us, Patrick and Stephanie, on any unrelated stuff. I know we were there out there all the time for the years that you lived out there. Did you ever no. bump into them or anything? No. The only interaction I had with any law enforcement out there was uh, the Nia Bay Public Safety Department. You know, okay. We would come in and do work on their building. Or okay. Do you remember the application? When you put that application into? The what? When for you put department? that application into? You applied to the EBA, right? Right. Law enforcement. Yeah. Well, right. I, I don't know if you can call them law enforcement. Okay. <laughs> they call themselves call law officers. Officers. I don't know. So they, they ride in police cars. <laughs> do, they, do they have weapons and stuff? Or are they non like They RV do, but yeah. It's it's a different world. Are there. they like RVPSOs up here? No, it says they have weapons. You know RVPSOs out in the village? Right. They're like safety village officers, public safety officers. Yeah. No, they they have more authority. They have their own tribal court and everything. But so they're not state. They're not. Uh, they're a sovereign peace. nation. So they're not. Are they not peace officers by the state of Washington? They're they are. Trained by the state. Okay. Yeah. 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 They go through the state academy. The they just have limited authority on anyone. On me. Oh, I see. Yeah. See, I was when I was living there. Anytime I would get in trouble, well, I didn't get in trouble all the time. But you know, they would they would call the sheriff office for anyone who was Civilian. nominated. Like a base kind of. Yeah, they have a little bit more now, a little bit more leeway on, on that. The laws have changed a little bit, but that's. There, well, that was, right. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me because there was some crazy stuff that was happening when I left. So So even if you lived there, they um, couldn't. You, you lived in Nia Bay, they couldn't do anything with you? They'd have to call Not you to prosecute or sure, they could detain you. But if it happened there, that they still could. Okay. Hmm. No, if, it, if it had been anything major, it probably would have gone to federal. And that's why that's why Ted was asking that because because the other agents who worked in our office would be out there a lot for any kind of major incidents that were happening out there and right. were out there quite a bit. So. Yeah, I don't no, I don't recall meeting any. How many people live in the Bay and the reservation? Probably about two thousand twenty five hundred. Yeah. So when, when you first went out there, you didn't start working for the tribe right away. What were you doing to get by? What kind of work were you doing? Were you doing the normal type of stuff? Uh, I was on unemployment. Between the military and the other? Yeah. Yeah, and I had, uh, my license was revoked at the time, so I was keeping my driving to a minimum. They, uh, yeah, it wasn't easy getting a job in Nia Bay. I'm one of the only white guys in the world. Right, right. <laughs> How'd you do that? Did you know somebody in, in the department or something? Well, I interviewed for a few jobs, but, you know, they, for the job they finally hired me for, they um, there just wasn't anybody else who had my qualifications. That's what got me the job. So I got the job in spite of myself. And, uh, well, that's part of why I was asking, because we know it can be difficult, and so I thought maybe you had to establish, establish yourself in the community before you had an opportunity to, to get a job, but it sounds like... It might have been that. some of that, too, I mean, because I had lived there for a few months, so people knew. There were, there, it's a rumor mill there, so people kind of knew who I was and what I was doing there, but... Um, you know, for the first year that I worked for the tribe, there was, I wasn't that popular for... Working for them, it's kind of kind of interesting to have the shoe on the other foot. You know, they thought you were intruding or taking a job away from. Right. Yeah. You know. We're working on one of the buildings.
signs there or something. Have people drive by. Like, Go home, white boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly not the impression we got after you were there for a few years. You no, know, like I could say after a well. year, that was everybody pretty much. Well, every all the work I did was so obvious. It was. Everything around town was like right out in the open, like public recreation areas and stuff. Everybody in town knew about it and knew who was doing it. So after about a year, it was, it was better than what they used to. They were used to. Right. Yeah. There's <laughs> generally speaking, most of the people living in New Bay are pretty cynical of whatever the tribe is doing. So they were pretty impressed with the immediate because parks and recreation didn't exist until they hired me. It was a brand new idea that they had. So, oh. so they. It was an unpopular idea at first because they were paying out, you know, the salary for something that people didn't think was going to do anything. Anyway. Is the reservation land just in Nia Bay, or does it? In, I mean, it's like they're like the town, and then lots of land outside. Of yeah, Bay? it's it's a pretty large reservation and. Unlike some of the other reservations where there's pieces of land kind of scattered in an area, New Bay is pretty encompassing. It's a beautiful piece of land all the way up on the northwestern tip of the state. It's pretty nice there. Right on the water. Um, I was wondering if we could uh, talk to you a little bit about your early years in Washington, because that's kind of unclear to us, but you lived in Colville for a while? Right. When did your family move to Colville? Do you know roughly? Wow. Uh, well, they they drove to Washington from Utah, and I think I was about five years old or something. Okay, so quite a while. Right. Okay. Four or five. And you lived there until you moved to Oregon for that year? Right. Okay. And then after Oregon, you moved to New York? Yeah. And then joined the Army and then went to Fort Lewis? Right. Okay. Um, when you were living in Colville, were you there in 96? Do you know if that sounds like the year? Yeah. Okay. I would have been there. Yeah, I was there in 96. 97 was... See, 98 was the year when the Army, 97 was the year I was in Oregon. So, yeah, 96 would have been the last year, probably the last year. Did you get your driver's license there? Yeah. But I, I yeah. Did you get it right when you were eligible, or did you wait? Do you know? No, I didn't get my driver's license until I was 18, I think. At the time, it was kind of a loophole, small town kind of driver's license because uh, they weren't even supposed to give me the driver's license eligible for ID because I didn't have a social security number at the time. So. But for some, it was like through some glitch, they ended up giving me a regular driver's license. Just It just didn't have a social security number on it. And, uh, and then when I moved to New York, I had to get a social security number. Do you have to take a driving test or anything? Not in New York. In no, Washington, I did. Oh, yeah. 64 Chevy pickup. <laughs> when you were living in Colville, um, do you remember the case where um, Julie Harris, she was a double amputee, went missing? And they've got a suspect in the case, so we're not trying to talk to you about you being involved in that but 96 yeah she lived I think pretty close to you and she went missing and they I found do remember her. hearing about that and she, my, small, she was young I think like 11 or 12 I remember the name I don't remember the details of the story I remember that it was it seems like it was a pretty big deal mm -hmm. it was in local news and stuff and I was working construction at the time so I would hear stuff but I, I never took a personal interest in it okay it's kind of one of those passing, passing interest kind of things. Okay. Sounds like it was pretty big news. So I just kind of didn't know if that had any impact. That's on probably it. why I remember it. I mean, but it was. Uh, 
I don't I don't remember enough of the details and so what my thoughts were at the time. Okay. Um, how about the um, talk a little bit about the boat? Um, you know, understanding from all the digging we've been able to do on the old records is um, the boat came from uh, William Hawkins. Right. Yeah, that's Keaton's dad. Okay. I think. Yeah. Okay. What was the boat like when you got it? As far as what kind of, it looks like, you did a lot of work on it. But what was was it seaworthy when you got it? It would have floated. Yeah. The engine work. <laughs> the rowboat. <then. laughs> no, the engine didn't run very well. The interior was trashed. Uh, steering. Back. I mean, it wasn't. No, it, it wasn't. It had potential, but it wasn't something you would take out for the afternoon. <laughs> okay. So how, how long did you have it before you ended up getting it seaworthy? Uh, it didn't take me very long. I, I don't remember exactly. And there was, uh, it seems like it took me a while to get the title or registration or something. I don't know. There was some, there was some issue with that, too, it seemed like. Yeah, I don't think you registered until '06, and I think you got it in 2005. So okay. It seems like I did. I, yeah, I took it. I had taken it out a few times before it was registered. Um, was your original purpose for the boat purely recreation? I mean, we've been told what you know ultimately happened with um, you know at least a few victims, but was that something that you were thinking about? before that hey a boat would help facilitate this type of stuff or was it you know kind of an afterthought after you had it? Well I'd always been interested in boats. I've been building them since I was like fifteen or something like that. Okay. Uh, no the the boat was kind of like just an opportunity that popped up. And how did that come about? I mean did you just like go visit Keaton's dad and see his no, boat he and ask for. He told me about it. I had seen, uh, I don't remember how the subject came up, but he, he had told me about it and showed me a picture and said he had, uh, said he had all this material that it was ready to be finished and, uh, and then he brought it over. He, he told me, he said, I don't you know how much he wanted to sell it for. And, he was living in central Washington, I think, at the time. So he towed it over the pass to Port Angeles, and I took a look at it, and it was it was in a lot worse shape than he had made it sound like. And uh, so I think I talked him down on the price a little bit or something, and, and just you know he didn't want to tow it back over the pass, so I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll take it. But it wasn't something I was all gung ho about because I was more into like canoes and rowboats and stuff. But no, it was it was fun while it lasted. It was just just a hobby. Mm -hmm. Had you had a motorboat before, or primarily just canoes and kayaks? Canoes, kayaks, yeah. Can you build them? I built a couple of them, yeah. Canoes? Uh, yeah, kind. Of, well, uh, most of the things I built were kind of hybrid ideas. I kind of thought up on my own. They were like a cross between a canoe and a rowboat kind of thing. But uh, most of them were pretty unstable. <laughs> <laughs> Did you use them in the lakes or did you use them in a river? What would you use them in? Uh, I was, the one I built in Nia Bay, I would take out and uh, I don't know, me and Lainey would go out and fish and stuff in it. But um, I, the, I, I had never had a boat big enough to where you could go out and do uh, island camping. There's a bunch of lakes out there that have these big islands and stuff. So, so that was the initial idea that I was going to you know, build a boat big enough that you could put all the camping gear in and you know, have room for whatever and go around those lakes. And, so that was initially the idea with the, with the motorboat, but it wasn't. It wasn't very well suited for that, but that's mostly what I used it for you know, until I got into water skiing a little bit. And that was it. So. Do you have boats after that, or was that your last? 
That was the oh, last no. one, except, I mean, we had that kayak up here, but that was... But down there, that was the only, like, motorboat that you had. Right, so. yeah. But I thought there were some... I thought I remember seeing in the file cabinet some other... Title titles for boats. I don't remember. Now. I definitely saw a title for a different boat because the date was different. Yeah. But I don't. I don't, I don't remember. remember what it was. Yeah, there was another boat project that I had in mind, but it was it was too. I mean, and I actually did. I towed that back to Mia Bay, and, but it needed too much work. I just scrapped that project. Okay. It was a bigger. It was like an ocean going. Okay. I think it was an 18 or 19 foot boat or something. That might be what it was then. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our understanding from listening to the interviews and stuff like that and talking with these guys is that there was two victims that were disposed of by the boat. Um, we've always made the assumption that there were two Washington victims, but I don't know if that, you know, if you clarify if we're understanding that correctly or not. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to Okay. Any more detail on that yet. Um, you talked once about um, that some of your friends may have like knowing, unknowingly assisted you in some way. Um, and I've never really understood how to take that comment if it was, you know, something like, uh, you know, we've seen that you're not always 100% uh, honest on your timesheet. And if it was something like your boss knowing you were <laughs> playing hooky or something like that, is there anything that you can tell us about? No, well, there have been Yeah, I mean I nobody knows the reasons I would ask people to do things or the reasons I would give for why I was doing them were you know, seldom realistic with what was actually going on. Mm -hmm. So that's um Dave was you know, he, initially he was just my boss, and then over the, after I'd worked there for a few years, you know, we started hanging out and, and doing stuff together. And he, I think he actually went on a couple of the boat camping trips with me. Um, he actually held some guns for me when I was moving up here, you know, mm -hmm. so. Um, there were details like that, you know, I, you know, I would tell him, well, you know, I pulled these guns for me because I don't want to drive them through Canada when maybe that wasn't necessarily the reason why I was, didn't want to drive them through Canada. Mm -hmm. Was he probably your closest friend down there? Yeah, over the years, I would say. <clears throat> probably. But, you know, at the same time, I didn't... I didn't really talk to Dave uh, that way. There were there were really only a few subjects that we would really talk about, so. Like Not what? like, oh, I'm sorry. So like, like, what was that that you talked yeah, about? Football mostly. Oh, that's right. Football work stuff. I think I've seen Dave maybe four or five times, usually if we're in town. We've got some reason to stop and chat with him, and he's never not been in Packer gear. <laughs> yeah. I think any of our It started reasons. out as quite the love-hate relationship between me and him, so. Why, who were you, what's your team? Vikings. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So, plus, you know, I've. When I started watching football in the Army, the reason I. I was never interested in sports, and to, but I had a, one of the guys in my squad in the Army was like a diehard Vikings fan, and he absolutely hated the Packers. And it was his hatred for the Packers that actually got me into <laughs> football. <laughs> the guy would like be on his knees in front of the TV screaming at Brett Favre, you know, and I was like. Oh, this is pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, up until that point, I, didn't, I couldn't even tell you what a touchdown was. Uh, so that was the reason I started. I became a Vikings fan because of him, and then I met Dave, and he was a huge Packers fan. So even more reason to be a Vikings fan. Right. Like, yeah, if you lost as a Packers fan. So did you rub it in when Favre jumped over to the Vikings? and? No, I, actually, I actually hated that. I was, okay. I was ready to jump ship on the way. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Really, you didn't see that as a good thing? <laughs> That's... 
I, I was, I was, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. That's sacrilegious. So you didn't have conversations with uh, Dave like you did with Matthew Perkins? No, we never. Different kind of no, friendship. No, that was the last. Every time, see, well, Perk, I don't know, he, he was a different kind of character, so I wasn't that worried about that. But every time prior to that that I had ever talked to anybody about anything, it always got me in trouble. So up until I met Perk in the Army, I, I, just, I just didn't talk to anybody, mm -hmm. really. What are you talking about when you were younger? You get, get your trouble right, with your parents? Until the time of like 17, 18, yeah. yeah. I had friends growing up, you know, and they would constantly open their mouths and, you know, ruin my good image, so. <laughs> you weren't worried about that with Perkins? Sounds like you had some pretty strict rules, though. So. Yeah. Perk was, he had, he had issues, so I thought, you know, Plus, he was kind of antisocial too, so he was. Uh, but you know, that being said, you never be too careful. It's like, you know, like now, I haven't talked to him for years. I don't even know what he's doing. So. Anyway. He works at a hair salon. Would that surprise you? Yeah. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he works at a hair salon. That surprised us. I didn't. That was not what I expected. He's still in Ohio. Cleveland. I don't remember. I was thinking it was New York, but I could be wrong. No. Um, I know, but I, I can't remember. I, yeah. I can find out and tell you, but I don't remember if it was Ohio or not. He didn't look like a hairstylist? No. He was, he was a different character. It doesn't surprise me, though, because he was, he was uh, really quiet, but he was you know, salvageable. He, he was starting to come out of his shell a little bit in the army, so... Um, the other thing I want to ask you about is, I had a bank robber uh, case that uh, involved a guy named uh, Bradley Robinette, and he was a local Port Angeles guy, and he was really big into the caches, where he'd cache weapons, camping equipment, money, all that kind of stuff. And we ended up finding two of them, one out in Squim and then one toward Nia Bay. Um, they think they were his. Yeah, we're, we're pretty sure they're his. We'll show you, I'll show you photos sometime if you want. Um, did any of your caches anywhere ever get discovered that you know of? I would seriously doubt it. Okay. Seriously. You don't think they happened upon one of yours? Then your I seriously doubt it. Okay. Could someone identify your caches from I mean this guy Robinette's caches, I mean he had his, you know, fake driver's license and stuff, but with his real name and stuff in there, so it was kinda easy to right. attribute some of them to him at least. But no, I any of mine, I don't even, I was usually, I, I didn't even leave fingerprints. Okay. So, because I was aware of that, it's, it's a slim possibility, but you know, it still happened. Yeah, yeah. And this guy had a lot of caches, and you know, we found two, which means there's probably 18 others out there. He was prolific in caches, um, but I just wondered if you ever had any that you discovered later were gone. No. Most of them I never, never go back to. Well, I mean, other than maybe it's still there, but. Um, I know Lucas talked about, uh, you know, you picking up some guns that, you know, you had, that he held for you. Um, right. Can we assume those are in caches or? You came up in 2007, so before you drove the Alcan, you gave them to him. Right. And then you went, were back, were you back in that area in 2008 when you visited Green River, Wyoming? And so could they be I in Green River? one of the guns he had in it was in that cache in New York. The, that we have? Yeah. Okay. Which one was that? It was a Ruger 10-22 that, was, that I, after I brought it up here, I flew it. Yeah, that's why it was in 
that's why I left it with him because um, you know, it's a long gun. So, so I've been. It was one of the ones I was thinking about cutting down. I just hadn't got around to it, and uh, so I left it left that with him. And then I think I flew it up here, and then uh, worked on it up here, and made some modifications, and then took it back to. Anyway, it ended up in the one in New York. But that's why he ended up with the guns. Because uh, there, there was that one, and I know that I think there was at least one other that he had that he was holding for me. Yeah, I think he, I thought, I have to look back, but I thought he told us about a handgun. That makes sense that he had a handgun. Yeah, there was. I, I want to like you say there was at least one other gun. They were all in one case, like one rifle case, I think. And uh, the ten twenty twos, they're they're too big to cash unless you cut them down. So. So the other one, the handgun, maybe is cashed, or did you bring that back up here too? I don't know which one. I don't. Um, Yeah, I don't remember which one was in that case, or if there was more. I just remember that's why he, I asked him to hold on to them, because of that 1022, otherwise I just would have buried them all and washed it there. Oh, okay. It was just easier to, to have him hold them. Do you have a cache in Washington? Is there a gun buried in Washington? There's stuff buried in Washington. So what about anybody besides Dave? Did you leave any any guns or anything else with anyone else in Bay besides Dave? No. Well, I sold I sold some guns, but they were they I sold I sold at least one to another coworker. But it was mine. It had always been mine. I just didn't. It wasn't an Alaska gun, so, and I wasn't much into hunting anymore, so I just sold it to him. It was like a hunting hunting rifle. How many guns would you say you've had over the years? Lots? When I mean, you go through Ever? several guns a year? No, in the last ten years. Ten years? I don't know. I, I don't... I mean, the ones that are buried, I don't really consider mine. Okay. Were they yours? Some of them, okay. but I mean... Depends on your definition. <laughs> um, well, I know if you take them, they're yours, but... Right. They become yours. No, I'm, I mean... It's... The guns that get buried right away and that I don't... That I don't dig up or move around or whatever, those aren't, you know, some of those aren't mine. Why they're very good. When you say the ones that are yours, where did you usually get them from? I always got my guns from private party sales. Sometimes there would be, I mean, you know how it is. Sometimes you take down license, driver's license information with somebody you don't even know, and, you know, and that's it. I never registered any of them. I'm guessing a lot of the people I got guns from didn't have them registered before me. There's people who just swap guns mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Especially up here. It's like a hobby or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, at least you're getting those guns off the street. Right. So it's kind a lot of, of what I do that could be considered public service. Yeah. So. so do you, I mean, at some point in time, do you think that you would be telling Giving, letting us know where these caches are. Um, would you remember where they are? Well, yeah. Some of the stuff is going to be relevant. Right. So. Right. But typically, you, you were saying you didn't go back to these caches. No. So. Usually, there were exceptions, like the one that I had in Vermont. I knew that was in a bad place, and it wasn't well well prepared when I buried it. So. 
and went back to get that one. There was one in... There, it seems like there was a flood one year in Washington, and I started thinking about one, and I was like, well, that one's going to be in trouble, and I went back, and it was underwater, so I had to, I had to move that. But usually I would plan it wherever I put them to where they would be pretty well protected. And, and mostly things were buried. I know there was one here that was it was above ground, but pretty much. It wasn't really a cache, though. Well, the, you had some the North Fork of Yulard? Oh. Yeah. So, okay, otherwise. <coughs> yeah, that was disposable materials. You, you talked once on um, one of the interviews about kind of having, trying to set up alibis during some of your crimes. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on what kind of alibis you'd set up and would you pass your cell phone off to other people to hang on to or different things like that or is it more just No, I never was specific with anyone. You never passed but your phone. There was a lot of stuff that I did with that was uh, you know, I would do it in conjunction with something else that was going on. A pretty tight timeline if you you could say so that if it ever came up then it's not like I would be in a situation where I had to explain where I was for days on end or something. That was more along the lines, but I never had any, say, alibis like people who would vouch for me or something. No, there was, there was nobody. But the timeline would make it look like it was difficult for you to right. get in there. Yeah. Or had enough time like to do something. Did you ever see your cell phone um, statements while you were working at the tribe, your tribal cell phone statements? Did you ever see copies of those? I think, I don't remember exactly how that worked. I don't think so. So they just, they, you just had a phone and they paid your bills and you just, yeah. okay. Yeah, pretty sweet deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Back then, were you thinking far enough ahead to... Were you taking your battery out of your phone and stuff like that when you went off to do things? Or? Uh, well, I was pretty new to cell phones. When I initially started, all I had was a pager. I think I had a personal cell phone from a girlfriend for a while. But, I mean, initially all the cell phones we had in the Bay were analog. And then uh, when they switched to digital, yeah, I started, you know, I, I would take the battery out sometimes. So you didn't have the same phone the whole time you were in the Bay. They upgraded at some point. I think I. It seems like they changed my number at least once. I changed phones. I know at least twice. And uh, yeah, beyond that, I don't remember. Um, cell phones out there are not that reliable anyway. Yeah, they're not as big a deal as they are up here. So I, and I think when Ted was asking about the alibi thing, he wasn't referring so much to you saying to someone, hey, if anybody asks, I was here, but more like ahead of time telling, maybe telling someone hypothetically you were going somewhere, but actually going somewhere else. I mean, was that the Oh, right. Stuff? Yeah. Right. You know, I'd take trips to eastern Washington and say I was going to see old friends or go to see the old place in eastern Washington and, you know. Went to Oregon. Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, I may have gone to eastern Washington, but it doesn't mean I went to see old friends. I don't have any old friends in eastern Washington. So, okay. <laughs> so it's, you know. After you and Tammy broke up, Lainey was living with Tammy, right? No. She, was she staying with you? Yeah. Oh, she was. Okay. But Tammy, do did she have like, was it a setup visitation or was it just because you were so close and it just whenever she wanted to go? No, I got home? custody. I, I had legal custody of Lainey while I lived on the reservation. Okay. Tammy was. Uh, she was in and out of treatment and stuff, so. Okay. 
I mean, as Tammy describes it, when she was going through the issues with her drug addiction and stuff, I mean, it sounded like it was pretty terrible um, and stressful, for, probably for you and, and Lainey. Um, was that ever a trigger for you to, you know, just the stress of all that to, you know, go out and do something? Or was that a non-factor? Well, yes and no. Uh, that caused me more problems uh, locally because that was a new thing for me to be in a situation that I wasn't in control of. Like with Tammy, near the end of our relationship, I wasn't in control of the situation. It was out of control. So, um, you know, that I got... I was out driving in the Bay one night, you know, I drank too much and got pulled over. I should have got a DUI that night. Anyway, the sheriff never showed up, so they just held me in the Bay for the night jail. And they let me dry out. And anyway, so there was some issues like that. There was at least one time I remember she called the cops on me and I was pissed off about that. So there was, uh, yeah, there were some issues with that. But uh, no, for the most part, I was. Uh, it was easier. Tammy was, when we were living together, she was uh, a lot nosier than I was used to. So she would keep track of what I was doing online or whatever, where I was going, you know. So. How about when you started like a new relationship, like when you first met Kim, did that, you know, the excitement of being in a new relationship and stuff like that, did that, um, I guess, make it easier not to do something? Yeah, there were, I had lots of distractions along the way, it's, that's, you know, it's like one hobby after another with me. Before I met Kimberly, I was well. I was building that canoe and building different stuff for people around Nee Bay. I was still pretty into the construction thing and was doing a lot of work on cars and heavy equipment and stuff, which was a new thing for me. So, mm -hmm. and being busy was a way to put off doing stuff. I mean that kept you in line, I guess? Yeah, there, well, yeah, but, I mean, no, that's just the way it had to be. And then everything else is inevitable. Mm. It's just a matter of how long. So it sounds like you were purposely trying to stay busy. I just to always prolong have. things, or? I just always have. It's, it's, uh, A lot of the stuff that I've that I've done is not even for because I had to do it or because for financial gain or you know it's just to stay busy and just to do something new I guess. But that you know when the sun goes down, it's all. <laughs> Doesn't matter how many hobbies you have, it's all, all it comes back to the same thing eventually. I think you talked one time, maybe it wasn't the last time these guys talked with you about uh, B B T B K T or the BTK. BTK and about you know how he went seemingly dormant for a long time um, and how difficult that probably was for him. Can you give us a ballpark of like the longest you were able to go between things? Is it months, years, when you were active at least? Well, I could go for more than a year, but not. It really depends what you qualify, but. You know. um, like guns were a big, always a big hobby for me, and explosives and stuff, so. Explosives? Did you make bombs? Nothing too exciting, but yeah, I, mean, I would tinker around. I'm mostly just designing stuff. I never. Say, where do you go to blow that up? They don't do that in the backyard. 
there's lots of places in the Abbey that do stuff. Well, maybe in the Abbey. They go out to the valley, I guess. Yeah. No, I got. <laughs> I gave all my most of my bomb making stuff away before I came up here. Um, Is it black powder based stuff, or did you get into no, more most, of the? No, yeah, mostly black powder. And when you messed around with that stuff, was it? Were you using it in conjunction with some type of crime, or were you just sometimes, but not okay. usually? I, I discovered power tools a lot more effective than explosives, so. and a lot quieter. Were you breaching with explosives? Yeah, a couple times. I was I started doing that when I was, <laughs> when I was like 14. It was the first time I, I, I blew, a, blew a, first time I blew a lock with a pipe bomb when I was about 14. Like to a shed or a garage or something? No, it was a, it was a forest service gate, I think. So this is when you were out in Colville then. That's where you would have been living at the time. Was it hard not to get caught doing that stuff, given you didn't have any transportation to get away? I mean, you must have been doing it nearby. I had a motorcycle. Oh, okay. I had a couple motorcycles. No, but I was... The other stuff, before I got my motorcycle, I would just, you know, be walking around in the woods. I would hike for miles. And, you know, I knew I knew every, every inch of that area, so... Was, were the Colville cops... I don't know if it was Tribal PD where you were at or if it was Sheriff's Office, but did they know you based on some of your troubles or not? No. No. No, they... It seems like there was a break-in or something at one of our neighbor's houses that well, I, I wasn't, I didn't have anything to do with, and they, they came and talked to me, and then I got... There was a civil case where a neighbor complained that I was shooting at her dogs, and she took us to court. And uh, but I, I don't think that wasn't criminal. I never got arrested for it. Or anything, so. hmm. Were you? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but come on. They, they were on your property. So. They were pit bulls. Yeah, yeah they, were pit bulls. they weren't nice dogs. Self defense. <laughs> And so going back to like time between things, I mean, I guess my perspective of would be criminal activity, not necessarily, you know, how long could you go or how long had you gone in between feeling like you had to sort of do something to get that rush that you've talked about in some of the other interviews. Well, like I say, if you count, if you count weapons, illegal weapons, um, Always had had them around or had access. To but you, but like you talked about, bank robberies kind of did it the same right. thing yeah, for you. It's not right. Sometimes if breaking into like a house could do it. Adrenaline rush type, right? How about just victims? Like, how long could you go between victims? Well, I went a long time when I was in the army. It's it piqued my curiosity, power tools. I know we've talked about, I think, one before. The drill. The drill. The hand drill. Oh, well, that little portable yeah. screwdriver. That you had in Texas with the right. drill bit in it. No. What, are, what kind of power tools are you talking about? <laughs> I'm going to get one of those DeWalt six-piece sets with the 18 volt batteries. And an angle grinder with a high-speed cutoff wheel will cut through pretty much every single high-security padlock there is. It doesn't matter what kind it is. And I could cut through them in about two or three minutes. So noisy, but not as noisy as a pipe bomb. Well, yeah, I guess they're noisy, but... Throw a blanket over yourself and somebody sees the sparks. 
<laughs> Theoretically. Was that pre-army right. Right. Pre or post-army? Sounds like post. Right. No, I didn't have... That was in Nia Bay that I... They didn't even come out with a lot of those tools until... Right. Was in That's what I was it's just been so. in the last mm -hmm. 10 years that they've really become good enough to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you got to have a generator and plug it in. Oh, that's right. Feeds the purpose. <laughs> yeah, we've been um, pouring through missing persons reports and you know doing all that kind of stuff, trying to you know come up with possibles. And we both realize that we're not solving any of the Washington stuff without you. Um, just not going to happen. Uh, any clues or bones you can throw us to keep us busy until that time you can <laughs> talk to us? I mean, I've been puzzled about your, um, you seem adamant that there's no possible federal nexus with the Washington cases. And um, I'm just shocked because knowing the peninsula like we do, there's so much federal land out there, especially with the national forests, national parks. and. You know, my understanding then would be that nothing's happened on those type of lands. Are we correct in understanding that, or no? I just didn't. I didn't know that would qualify as a federal crime. Well, if it's a national park or something. Mm -hmm. okay. National park or national forest, we could have jurisdiction on a felony. So, see, this all this stuff is the legal details all new to me. So. But that's good to know. But that's a possibility. <laughs> okay. You got me more curious about the caches and stuff now too. You know, how many caches are there in Washington? Washington, United States, Canada. The idea with caches is um, to have something everywhere, wherever you might you never know when you're going right. to feel the need. Not um, tied to stay at home kind of guy, so. You know. So there's a lot of them. Well, I don't know. A dozen? No. There's not. No. Ah. Jesus, nothing. That won't be that hard. <laughs> yeah. <it'll, laughs> we got that. How many in Washington? One relative. How about at least the, one in Washington? At least one. <laughs> Is there one that's not relative that we could look for? No. They're all relative? Relevant? Well, relevant to, I know you said there was one in Washington relevant to stuff we may be talking oh. about in the future. but yeah. Well, they're all relevant. That's what you have them for, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, because a lot of the stuff in them at the time that I buried him, you know, it's not mine, so. Mm -hmm. Any other bones for these guys? <laughs> no, not literally, sorry. <laughs> I didn't even mean it that way, but okay. <laughs> Can I ask the, the writings that they had found in your, your cell way back? Any of those Washington victims that were described? Right. Oh. oh, DOC gave you that stuff they took? Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what. I, I mean, yeah. One of those is probably. a victim, probably. Okay. I just wanted to show you this one when we were looking. It resembles you, doesn't it? Is that a real picture or is that like a composite? Well, I think this is a composite that was written of the real, but that's freaky. Yeah. Could that be you? Well, I mean, compared to the one in Vermont they came oh. up with, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been in? Uh, have you robbed a bank in New Hampshire? No. No. You sure? 
Uh, no, actually. I don't think <laughs> No, you're not sure? I don't think No, I don't think it would Yeah, the other one's not near as good. The real one. Huh? The real picture's not really as good as... doesn't look as much like you as they're drawing. Um, when was that one? Oh, six. Oh, six. Hook set. Hook set, New Hampshire. Sounds familiar. Now you're just teasing there. me. Huh? Now you're just teasing me. No, I just flew into New Hampshire a lot. Of, I was looking at banks in New Hampshire. I know, I, you know, I flew in there a lot of times. So. Did you fly into Manchester when you went there? No yeah, way. I not usually fly into Manchester. There's not too many other places to fly into there. Right. Which is, I mean, Manchester is basically a suburb of Boston, right? Yes, mm -hmm. southern New Hampshire. Right. So anything else from, you know, Washington, any questions, anything you can think of? I mean, we're, we're not going to be here much longer, so, you know, it's, I'm not sure what you could ask, but it's an opportunity. So we're heading back that way, they can so. Do. <laughs> hmm. No, I don't think there's anything else. I mean, Washington was quite a while ago now. That was, when did I leave there? Oh, six or... But you go back there fairly frequently. When you go, when you stop through there, do you and you? I used to stop through a lot more when Lanny yeah. was when Lanny was there. Check on the cash. Well, there was. I mean, yeah, there were stops that I made there that I try to maximize my time. You know, multitask. Efficient. Right. So. I just haven't had as much reason to stop in Washington since uh, since I ain't been living up here. So. How did that happen? I know for a while Lainey stayed back in Washington. She didn't come with you when you first moved up here. How did she end up? How did you end up getting her back? Um. Well, you know, basically the short story is Tammy. I think she fell off the wagon, and I kind of sensed that. So. But yeah, I mean, when Lainey came moved back up here, I, I didn't technically have legal custody. Uh, so I was going to ask, did you go to the courts and get custody? Or no, it was more one of those things. I kind of knew what was going on. I didn't make an issue, big issue of it, because I didn't want to go back to court with Tammy on it. So I just kind of made it sound like, you know, let's do this for a while, see how it works kind of thing. And then, you know, one year turns into two years or whatever. And next thing, you know, she's... My intention was to, to get Lainey living back with me out of state and a good record and going to school or whatever, and then that way if Tammy tried to get her back at some point, then I would have a better case in court. But, Thanks for chatting with us. Yeah, appreciate it. All right, so I... Whatever point down the road you go, we may see these guys again. Actually, probably would see them again. If we get when we get to that point. And keep in mind the federal nexus that uh, they talked about in the national parks. Or yeah, I'll have to do some research on that. Um, we could do that for you. I mean, we can check if you want to do something. <laughs> just give me some grids. Yeah, just give me a, just give me a couple lakes. And I'll look them up for you. Huh? There's lots of I, I mean, we spent. Uh, Western Washington is, I don't even remember. I mean, I know all the places I went, and I know that they were all public areas, but I don't know which ones were state, which ones were federal. I don't know. I never really paid that much attention. I can let you use it. It might become important. You know, there's a lot that. of federal land out yeah. there. And there's, there's lots of other ways for it to go, be federal, too. Right. That, that's yeah. an easy way. That's a real easy way, so. Yeah. Okay. Else? Take a break and we'll probably get you back so that we don't interfere with anything that's happening this afternoon. Get some lunch before they go get there. You're going to go to the bathroom? Give us just a second.